Dan J4Z here and welcome to my ham shack in Rock Hill, South Carolina. My name is John and today we're going to talk about solar terrestrial data and how it helps us predict what's going on with the bands. Hey, NJ4Z here. Welcome to my ham shack. My name is John and I'm here in Rock Hill, South Carolina. And uh, on the last video, we talked about the basics of space weather and solar uh, flares, CMEs, and how they affect the ionosphere and the magnetosphere and what it means in the hams bands. So now that we kind of have a basic understanding, let's get into today talking about solar terrestrial data. And solar terrestrial data, um, you know, we, we talked about the NOAA prediction site uh, and you know the G and the R and the S well these are the the more minute pieces of information that you use that NOAA and NASA and everybody uses to make up uh, the G the R and the S so that we have an easier it's easier for laymen to understand what's going on so we'll get into this and, and start to look at uh, the di different individual characteristics of solar weather and the data and then that'll help us figure out what the bands are going to look like or could look like so let's uh take a look at this real quick all right so solar solar terrestrial data sources and you've probably seen this widget many many times whether it's on qrz um any spotting clusters, DX Heat, uh, DX Summit, any of those. Everybody uses these spotting clusters um, and or on, on uses this widget on their spotting clusters. So what this widget does is it kind of gives you a general overall of the information about the space weather and what the band uh, uh, conditions potentially look like. And it's on Ham QSL. It's on uh, the space weather news prediction. We uh, we talked about that. Um, it's on Space Weather News. Space Weather Woman, Dr. Uh, Tamitha, does a wonderful job explaining a lot of this. She'd be much better <laughs> to explain it to me, and she's not hard to look like, so probably would help out being a bit more entertainment value than my ugly mug, but uh, you're stuck with me. So also, um, as an aside note, the uh, WWV, the radio station, broadcasts the solar terrestrial data on its 5 megahertz, 10 megahertz, 15 megahertz, 20 megahertz uh, uh, frequencies 18 minutes after the hour. So if you want to hear it uh, on the radio, you can turn into those frequencies 18 minutes after the top of the hour, and sure enough, you'll get that information. Um, and QRZ actually has this right up on their front page. It's kind of neat, and uh, it's a really kind of uh, cool widget, and, and you can go out to, uh, I think it's Ham QSL. You can get this widget, download it, and add it to your QRZ page or your web page or anything else. I'm going to go ahead and change this frame real quick, and we'll go to the full presentation. That way you can uh, look at the screen as I'm seeing it, and it's a little bit easier to uh, digest. Okay, so let's look at the key components. First up is the SFI. That's the Solar Flux Index, and the Solar Flux Index is the measured ob ob observations of the um, X-ray and uh, UV components of the solar wind. And basically what happens is the, um, sol the solar radiation goes in, splits the atoms up, you get an abundance of electrons in the ionosphere and that helps with propagation, okay? So the solar flux index is solar RF noise at 2800 megahertz and it's closely related to the amount of ionization in the F2 layer of the ionosphere. It ranges between 50 and 300, um, but as SFI increases, D layer absorption and noise can increase as well. So some numbers are better for the low bands and some bound numbers are better for the high bands. It just depends on what you want to look at for those days. Um, you know, when you have you know, 100, 150, it's going to be pretty good for the high bands, but not as good for low bands. Then you have the sunspot number, uh, which is right here. 
sunspot number that's exactly what it means it's the number of sunspots that are facing on uh, on the earth side facing uh, the earth facing side of the sun that's a tongue twister i guess and then you have the a and the k indexes okay and let's talk a little bit about the k index because it's a little bit easier to understand the k index and they have planetary here so k is an individual measurement uh, the k index is measured at observatories all over the globe each of the observatories has a calibrated magnetometer and a measurement is taken every three hours of the magnetic field and uh, it gives the maximum deviation from a quiet magnetic field okay and that's what's recorded okay when they take all of those geomagnetic um, measurements the k measurements from around the globe from the magnetometers they average it out and it becomes the KP index. So you'll hear everybody talking about KP. Again, K is relative to the area you're in. KP actually is a planetary unit, okay? And that's the amount of disturbance in the field. It ranges from zero to nine, okay? Now the A index is a little bit different um, and it's a little more akin to what's really going on in, in the world as regards to the magnetic field. Okay, the K index is derived from the KP index over the last 24 hours. So they take the K index is measured every three hours. So there's eight measurements during the day. It's a rolling average with some uh, algorithm um, manipulation to it a little bit that you take the last eight um the last eight measurements of the KP index, you average those out, and there's, a, like I said, there's another little algorithm. It's not a direct average, and that gives you the A index for the day, and that ranges anywhere from I think it's zero to uh, I think it's 200, 300, 400, something like that, and or 400, yeah, it's 400. So um, when you see that eight index higher, it corresponds to the K value, KP value. So I put that little chart up here that has the K value zero through nine and the A value zero through 400. And then the conditions, very quiet, quiet, you know, an active major storm, major storm, severe storm. And, you know, we talked about it the last time, November 4th through the 5th, we saw a, a severe storm. We saw KP indexes in sevens. And I think the A index was somewhere around 90. So, um, you know, we don't want to see that number up because that means uh, the magnetic field is disturbed and we're going to have a lot of issues getting around. All right. Uh, the next number we want to talk about is this X-ray flux. Okay. And I put a little note up here that X-ray flux, that's actually flaring. Okay. So that's the type of flaring the sunspots are doing. Um, so right now they're showing on this thing, it's showing an, uh, an A3.7 which is a very, very small, it's, you know, that's really not even flaring. Um, it's just, you know, it's producing a lot of x-ray flux. Uh, but you, you'll see that change. Sometimes it's B, sometimes it's C, sometimes it's M. And then when you get up in the X's, that means you're getting a lot, you know, a lot of flaring activity and that causes, causes some issues. Um, the solar wind strength, we really won't want to look at that too much. It just know that that, when you see that's up, that means the solar wind's coming in faster and it's a little more denser. Proton flux, electron flux, those are the things they look at for the um, solar storm conditions, that S measurement um, at the poles. So you can keep an eye on this. Sometimes the proton flux will help with the higher bands, the 10 and 6 uh, propagation. But, um, you know, you just have to... Um, uh, take a look at that and, and and again it's not any general rule of thumb it, it's you have to you have to kind of correlate it and look at it over over time for you to know what's going on with that okay and then we have the interplanetary magnetic field um, that's basically the conjunction of the magnetic fields between the earth and the sun um, our our earth and in the sun actually the the solar fields when when we get the solar wind coming in and, and particles it's mag you get a magnetic component to it and so sometimes the earth connects magnetically to the sun uh through via that magnetic field and and that can 
sometimes cause some problems, but it's nothing really to worry about. But it, since it's on here, I wanted to give you that. The Aurora Latitude, that's where the, the Aurora can appear. Um, you know, if you see it say high, that's going to be um, a greater than 60 degrees north. Mid latitude is between 60 and, and 30 degrees north. So if you see this and it says uh, Aurora Latitude, it'll give you a, a direct measurement or a predicted measurement for there. Okay. Um, so up in this corner here, you have VHA con conditions. You can get some auroral bounce and you have to look and see what that says. If it's low latitude, high latitude, six meters from the EU, two meters in the NA in North America. Um, and those will show you, you know, what the sporadic E looks like. So if you see this two meter light lights up, um, for you, you know, you've got good two meter conditions, uh, for sideband for, you know, long distance propagation. EME is earth, moon, earth, or, or moon bounce. Um, you know, that's going to vary with the stage of the moon. And then this muff, which is the maximum usable frequency. Now we want to be, we want to pay attention to that, right? Because if we've got a maximum usable frequency of, let's say, 30 megahertz, then that means all the bands are open, you know, uh, 10 meters is what, 28 to, to about 30. So, you know, when you start to see that muff start to creep up and, uh, we're seeing it, you know, in the, in the twenties and the thirties, that means we've got good propagation all, all over the, uh, oh, sorry about that. All over the, uh, uh, the earth. Okay. And then they give you some general HF conditions down here, band conditions for 40 and 80, 30 and 20, 17, 12, 10. Um, it tells you geomagnetic field. That's going to be akin to the K and the A index. Uh, the signal, background signal noise that the is going to be, you know, tied into this geomagnetic field as well. Um, so when you start looking at, you know, it going up as regards to the K and the A and, and this going from quiet to noisy to active to, you know, minor storm, major storm, these S will jump up. And then the solar per solar flare probability, that's also saying, you know, they're looking at the sunspot groups and saying, you know, is there a possibility these things may flare within the next 24 hours? Um, so that, that gives you the basics of what you're looking at there. Um, so that should help you get a good feel for it. And then we talked about the RDS and the G and in the last video presentation, if you missed that one, you can go back and see it. But I went over the basics of solar weather prediction uh, or solar weather and from the prediction center and they use for flaring, they use R, which is radio blackout that goes one through five. Um, let me see if we, yeah, on, we have it spread out here on the side here. So the geomagnetic, uh, is the G and the solar proton flux, that's the S. So um, when these things start to change and you go up in, in scale, so the KP index gets up like we had November 4th, we had a seven, we were at G3, okay? Um, and that would be a G3 magnetic storm and the KP index would have been about a seven. Uh, for the solar proton flux, it's a log of the proton uh, uh, a log 10 of the protons that are coming in. Um, you have S through five and that's mostly towards the poles. Okay. So you're looking at a polar type thing. Now, when it gets up in that four or five range, then yeah, it can creep down. It'll start the Aurora start to boost up and you'll start to see issues at lower latitudes. But for the most time, this is lower, low, higher latitudes towards the top, towards the poles. And then of course the R is the radio blackout. Um, and that's the solar flare. So uh, like we talked about, you know, when, when we see a solar flare on earth, it's already hitting us. The x-rays, uh, cause the V absorption to go up in the D layer. So you end up with, um, you know, radio blackout and, uh, it's varying strength, you know, C-class flares, you still have really no radio blackouts. You might have some, some, you know, short duration radio blackouts, but when you get up into the M-class flares, R1, R3, and, 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 you know, an X-class flare, an R5, that, you know, high X-class flare, um, you're starting to, to really have some, some issues with radio blackout. And it could be very short term or it could be very long term in when, when terms of days. Okay. Now, I came up with a little basic interpretation uh, slide. 
and this is the basic one. So uh, basically, if you look at solar conditions, that's the sunspot number and the solar flux, and these are kind of tied together with sunspot numbers and solar flux. So if you say you've got zero to 10 sunspots, that's typically gonna translate down here in the solar flux index of somewhere between 64 and 70, which means we're gonna have some poor conditions on bands above, uh, above 40 meters. So, you know, 20, 15, 10, 12, those are all 17, gonna be closed or, or pretty much unusable. Now, when you start getting up into the numbers, when they start to get a sol uh, the, uh, the uh, sunspot number 35 to 70, then you start seeing the SFIs, uh, I'm sorry, 10 to 35, you see SFIs in 70 to 90 range. So now, you know, you're going to have conditions, fair conditions up to about 20 meters. And then when you start to see 35 to 70 sunspots, then we start to get in that 9100 solar flux index. And now, you know, conditions are pretty good up to 15 meters. And then when you start to get above 100, you know, uh, so let's say 90 to 100 sunspots and you're starting to see 120, 130 in that solar uh, index, you're going to have fair to good conditions on all bands. And then once we get up in that 150 range to 200, then holy smoke, you know, the whole, the whole world's talking on a wet noodle in five watts, right? And if we ever do get up to the 200 rating, then, you know, E skip comes in and six meters is bouncing. Uh, so, you know, you just have to, you know, hope that we see those kind of numbers without a lot of big flaring. We talked about the, you know, what happens with big flares, you know, radio blackouts, and we talked about CMEs. So we don't want those kind of things coming up. Um, on this side, we look at the geomagnetic conditions. That's the KP and the A. And again, you degrading uh, propagation is as we go vertically on this scale, zero through nine, zero through 400. And, um, you know, you start looking at noise levels, you know, zero through two on the KP, you're looking at, you know, S0 to S2 noise uh, for background noise we're talking about. And then when you get to three to four, you might have a, a, an S3 noise level to an S5 noise level. Um, when you get to a KP index of five, then things start to really start to go south on you. You're stocking noise levels as six. And then when you get up to uh, a KP of six and seven, then you're talking, you know, your S8 to S plus 20, S9 plus 20. So you, you, nobody's talking on the bands at that point in time, or, or you're, it's very close up propagation because the bands are just so noisy. Um, now we see, you know, S5 uh, or KP5 uh, index is about 1700 times about every 11 years. Uh, sixes are about 600. We just had a seven for a few days here or for a day. So there are about 200 of those per cycle. Eight's about 100 per cycle. And, you know, a nine, um, I don't remember the last time I saw a nine. I've been ham for five years, so I've been half a solar cycle and I've never seen a nine. And I, I, you know, I don't ever want to see a nine because uh, that's going to probably cause issues with the grid and power issues. Um, and I don't want to be back in the mid 1800s uh, when it comes to uh, what we would be like with electricity being an issue. Um, so now we talk about advanced interpretation and that's that X-ray class, flare class stuff, the proton flux and electron we, we talked about. And again, you can see on these, when you talk about an A9, A1 to a B9 flare, no major blackout areas. But when we start getting up at an X class, which we had an X class flare back, uh, what was it about? Uh, the, before Halloween, uh, we had an X, X1 flare and we saw a really strong blackout. Um, I wanted to save that, that uh, uh, prediction center so we could see it, so you can see it, but it was... Um, it was pretty pretty cool to see it actually happen on the on the graphical representation, and then the polar uh, the proton flux we were talking about, you know the high latitudes and when you start to see that, uh, I think I saw it somewhere around twenty or thirty thousand and uh, degraded uh, polar uh, regions HF so there wasn't much propagation across the pole, so those direct north shots for you or direct south shots to where you're going were very difficult. And then, of course, you have the electron flux, uh, which, again, is um, same kind of component, 
different particle. You have protons and electrons. So when you get electron flux pushing in at high rates, then you start to see blackout. Same thing with protons going in. You see high blackouts in, in, the, uh, in the polar regions. So I hope that kind of explain a little bit about, um, you know, what we're looking at when we start talking about these indices and you, you start to look at it. So pay attention to solar weather and, you know, pay attention to solar weather. Use the widgets that are out there to make determinations on what's going on with the bands. And you can always look at that. 80 to 40, 20 to 30, 15 to 10, um, little band at the bottom. But for me, I don't, I don't want to say I don't trust it, but I think those are very generalized. And sometimes, you know, the K index may, the KP index may be high planetary wise, but in your area, it may be a little bit lower and you might have better luck in propagation. Uh, again, we have to treat the ionosphere as cotton candy and not a hard egg shell. So you might end up with um, a good propagation around your area and, um, and have a pathway to somewhere in the world that, you know, is open just for a short period of time, sim similar to the e-skip, but even with the F layer, so in bad conditions. So, you know, there's, there's good information here to use to try and interpret things, but then always turn on that rig, take a look at it, unless we have conditions like we did last um, on the fourth where we had a KP seven index. I, I don't know anybody to turn on a radio and was making any contacts. I know a lot of people, uh, on Facebook were like, what is going on? The bands are dead. Well, yeah, we're in a middle, we're in a major, uh, geomagnetic storm. Of course, the bands are going to be dead. Nobody's out there. There's no propagation. The noise level is so high. You can't hear anybody. So, um, yeah, if you see a KP six, seven, I mean, don't even bother turning the radio, but if it's, you know, one, two, three, four, yeah, turn on the radio, see what's going on. Even if the solar flux is low, you still might make some contacts. And, you know, who knows? I mean, you, you like FT8 or FT4. I mean, that's weak signal stuff's usually there, even in poor conditions. So give it a shot. But uh, hopefully this helped you at least understand what's going on with that widget and how to look at it and say, yeah, you know, conditions might be pretty good today. Conditions may not be pretty good today. The one caveat I will give you, though, SFI for a day um, might give you some decent conditions, but we really do need to have that SFI up for a couple days in a row to really build propagation. Again, it's like cotton candy. The more SFI we put into that thing, the more sugar we put in that machine, the thicker the cotton candy gets. So then it becomes almost like a shell and we're bouncing stuff off easy when it's, we have a really high solar uh, flux index. But um, again, a couple days at a hundred plus and man will take off. And if, and if you are new to ham radio and you work the, the CQ worldwide DX sideband uh, contest Halloween weekend, you know what I'm talking about. I, in my five, six years of being a ham have never seen those kind of conditions. And we had SFIs in the low one hundreds to high, uh, to the high teens, one teens. So, you know, 118, 119, 115, um, and you know, the, the bands were great. I mean, there was wall to wall people on 10, 12, 15, 17, 20, 40. I mean, it was crazy. I, I spent most of my time on the high bands just because I was trying to fill out DXCC on those bands. So I was on 10 and 15 working stations all over the world. So, uh, again, this is the first time I've experienced that kind of propagation, and I'm so looking forward to cycle 25 as it ramps up towards solar maximum and we get better conditions over the next two to three years. And then we'll be on the downward slide again. Um, and that's where I came in. I came in at 2016. So we were on the way to solar minimum. So uh, we only get a few solar cycles in our life because it's 11 year cycle. So enjoy the one we have coming up. Um, and that's all I got for the day. So uh Hopefully this helped. If you have any questions, put them in the comments. I'll be glad to do that or email me. I'm good on QRZ. Um, and uh, with that, I will say a fond 73. Stay healthy, stay safe, stay passionate about amateur radio. And if you found value in this, please like and subscribe to our channel. Uh, and again, 73 is NJ4Z, and I'm out.